This short video is about the STT radar mode. STT stands for single target hacking and it comes in two flavors, Pulse STT and Pulse Doppler STT. They differ not only in terms of pulse repetition frequency but also in terms of their ability to guide missiles. Pulse in fact cannot guide the M54 Phoenix and guides the M7 through a continuous wave antenna. Pulse Doppler allows the employment of the M54 Phoenix in Pulse Doppler in active mode and the M7 Sparrow via the CW antenna and in PD mode. So, two notes before starting. In premise, missile guidance is still work in progress, although the WCS is much more realistic now. Second, the status of the countermeasures is frankly quite terrible at the moment, so we'll disable them, as the focus of this video is on the missile guidance rather than the effect of the missile itself. And eventually, when these two points are addressed, I will put together a new complete probability of kill, so PK, study, as I did a couple of years ago. Let's start with Pulse STT. As mentioned, this mode cannot guide it in 54, so it is de facto fire and forget mode. Moreover, the WCS itself launches the A54 active off the rail in certain conditions. So what happens when the target is further away than 10 nautical miles? Let's have a look. We start as usual with the mission editor. And the reason why I'm repeating these steps every time is because maybe not all of you are aware of the, the mission editor and how powerful it is. So hopefully this can be useful. So we have an F-14, as client, ready to go. Now, what do we want to test? If the target is coming dead ahead in front of the nose of the F-14, we won't see much, um, pretty much anything interesting. The Phoenix will just leave the rail, active, go towards the target, and then eat it, basically. The interesting part is testing what happens when the target is actually at a certain degree of antenna train angle. And in order to do that, we create a dummy, so a target we know uh, that won't turn defensive, and uh, we know countermeasures. Okay, so this is the scenario that I've quickly put together. An F-14, client, flying at 35,000 feet, um, with Phoenix and Sparrow. Another F-14, flying pretty much perpendicularly, uh, same altitude of speed, music copy paste. Uh, what we want to do, we want to have dummy, so make sure that we have selected, we have selected the first waypoint, and now we can set uh, we, that's probably not necessary, but it's fine. No reaction. Again, the focus here is testing how they behave, the missile guidance behaves rather than the, the target itself. And that's pretty much it. Okay, let's see what happens when we get into the cockpit. Let's open up. There it is. Okay, 20 miles. And missile off. Now, radar on standby because I don't want to guide the Phoenix. And there it goes. So, as you can see, it's still turning. And it's pointing the direction, well, actually, towards the position where the target was when it launched. And the interesting part is seeing what happens when the missile gets close to the 10 nautical miles from the target. See how he's tracking. Should have enough energy. And this is because the target is not defending at all. Okay, nice and simple. Let's see the tackle instead. Okay, missile off. Yeah, he's flying towards the previous position of the aircraft and target. And there, it acquired the dummy. So let's have a look at the distance. So it was said that the distance should be accorded to 10 nautical miles ish. And that's, yeah, that's fairly accurate. Yeah, there we go. And it starts turning. For the employment in pulse doppler city, I wanted something a bit more interesting. So we have the usual F14, exactly as it was before. Same Phoenix, uh, uh, A Mark 47. And on the other side, we have a Sukhoi 27. Same altitude, same speed, cap behavior run, so it will probably come after us right away. I just disabled the shafts, because again, the focus is on the guidance itself. And the status of the countermeasures at the moment is pretty terrible. Distance is 
52 miles. Okay, let's get into the cockpit and see what happens. 50 miles. What we want to do is go into boost up STT. Most of the times you can switch right away to STT mode from the TID. If you can't, just switch to radar on the end control unit and uh, lock right away from the uh, DD. We have two problems zero the per filter and the mail of clutter were actually notching, so we have to work on the mail of clutter filter. We can just turn off immediately because we are about to deploy a 35. And now crank. Copy that. And we want to go faster. On it. So the problem here, oh, and of course we want to dive. Copy. The problem in this case is the zero per filter rather than the notching uh, itself. Because if the target is above us, as you can see from the uh, antenna angle, we are diving 20,000. We need to go even faster. Roger that. We need to have the target above us so we can disable the uh, mellow platter filter. Roger that. Okay, that's fine. And we need to go Copy. faster. I uh, wish I had a pilot. Let's go down to range just fine. Roger that. Diverting, can turn Copy. to left. He's at 14,000. We are still going down. But well, we can see the effect already of the mail of clutter. But we got it anyway. So let's have a look at what happens. Okay, I'm still launched. Yeah, I immediately turned to defend. That was a pretty, basically a perfect notching. But since I was slightly lower, not lower enough to be honest, by Eisman, we have to do what we can with Eisman. Since we were slightly lower, uh, we could use, well, we have used the mellow clutter filter and we prevented it from notching. Uh, so why go faster? Because if the aircraft turns cold, it falls into, falls into the zero top of filter, breaking the lock. If you go faster, it's very, very, very hard for the aircraft to turn cold and be at the speed that is comparable to yours, so within plus minus 100 knots, and use the zero top of filter to break the lock. What I do this time, since I had the problem before, is dive immediately. And now we are cranking. So closure is going down a lot. Altitude, the target is still very high. Very, very high. Mellow clutter off to prevent notching. Roger that. Not sure if my first Phoenix will have the energy to get the target, so I'm setting up for a follow up. Roger that. It is still very high. Let's see what happens. Yeah, no, we got it. Nice. Cool. Let's have a look at it. So, Fox 3, F16, right away turning and trying to notch. It's not showing really well, but the problem is that I'm lower, so it, I'm using the middle of clutter filter to maintain the lock. 
that's all for this short video about PSTT and PDSTT. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have, consider dropping a like and uh, subscribing perhaps. Thanks for watching. And this is how the original video ended. But I noticed an issue with some notes not correctly displayed, so I decided to address it. Since I was reworking the video, I ran a couple of additional tests. Uh, namely, I wanted to see how the Phoenix launched in PSTT behaves if, within 10 nautical miles of its original target, another aircraft flies into the field of view of the Seeker. I guess that the M54 would lock onto the new target, but the only way to prove it is running a simple test. In the scenario running now, you can see the M54 flying towards the target placed in the top left corner of the screen. A new target is about to fly in the Phoenix's path. Okay, it seems that the 54 is pointing to the new target now. Hello there. And nope, it is still going for its original target. Let's have a better view by means of tech view. The fact that the phoenix is turning is purely a coincidence caused by how I placed the bait. However, as you can see, the M54 did not care at all and proceeded as nothing happened. What happens if I launch all my M54s in this manner, and then immediately turn cold since I don't have to sustain them? In this scenario I place the four targets, hot, spread both in azimuth and altitude from 10,000 feet to 25,000 feet, and in such a way that they won't fit in any type of scan solution. I launched the four M54s a Mark 47 at about 20 nautical miles, the Mark 60 can probably grant 5 nautical miles, uh, maybe more if the target aspect is within plus minus 10 degrees, but consider that the missile does not loft or lead. So let's see what happened. I was with the radar fully opened, but with better SA I could have probably narrowed it down a little bit and spinning up the whole process. I'm on it. The targets I used are configured exactly as my F-14, so full view and 422. Speed is 430 ground for each aircraft, and they are quite heavy indeed, but compared to the previous scenario I let them defend by maneuvering. Chefs were still disabled. Well, I did not expect to eat all of them, so let's see what TACVIEW reveals. It seems that the combination of a short range, hot aspect, weight, and no preemptive defense typical by the AI, and the lack of chaffs, uh, gave them little chances of success. Ok, let's do a final test now against 4 F-80C Hornets, clean uh, with shafts and using the same setup. Now that I have better SA, I don't need to open my radar entirely, I also decided to get slightly closer to the targets.
not too bad, 3 out of 4. But to be fair, I ran this scenario 2 more times later, scoring 50% and 100%. So the average outcome is not too shabby indeed. So when will you use this technique? Honestly, probably never. The only scenario where I see this plausible is when approaching the WVR arena versus an hot target, since the RWR is not triggered until the range between the M54 and the target is 10 go miles. And chances are actually that the missile is still accelerating at that stage. Anyway, it was a funny test to run and I hope you enjoyed it. Just keep in mind that this implementation of the M54 and the pulse STT may change in the future, so that's why I'm not doing any more thorough tests at the moment. Thanks for watching and like and subscribe folks, like and subscribe.